fortuitous nature of the internet offers the possibility not only to find information about how to access abortion services, but also about what to expect, what questions to ask. It gives us access to humans, people, who can respond to our real anxieties. However, the social and cultural taboos around abortion mean that for many women, information is often unavailable, and when it is available, it's most likely to speak towards discouragement. To compound this, concerns about sexual, uh, gender and sexuality are often a part of public debates around the need to limit rights to freedom of expression, information, and privacy on the internet. In many contexts, the preservation of gender norms and order is used as a pretext to mobilize state and non-state actors to force restrictions on access, on access to the internet, and the control and elimination of specific content that is viewed as the that is viewed as being against traditional values, particularly related to the family and women's bodies. While the incident has become a significant site for sexuality education and provides important access to information on a range of topics, including contraception, sexual pleasure, and abortion for women and girls, there is a growing trend of states to censor content on sexual and reproductive rights. What this means is that the severe limits women and girls' rights and evolving capacity to exercise sexual agency and decision making, decision -making about the critical component related to For vulnerable groups in particular who have no way of accessing this information, censorship serves to further limit their ability to exercise other rights that the internet enables. Decisions on what content to censor are also often framed within a protectionist approach, fueled by a moral panic that doesn't recognize women's agency or the critical role that the internet plays in enabling a range of lives. And in case you're wondering how this applies, it's just a little example. A few years ago, Facebook removed the profile picture of the executive director of Women on Waves because it contained information about how women can do abortions themselves. She then reposted the screenshot of the Facebook censorship message with the picture and asked people who followed her to do the same, which they did. The picture was removed again. And her profile was promptly blocked by Facebook. It was only after receiving inquiries from the journalists that they sent an email to her, apologized, and then acknowledged that the picture actually didn't violate any of the terms of use agreements. The next issue I'd like to talk about is privacy. Um, so while the discourse around censorship and content regulation is highly politicized around sexual rights, when it comes to privacy, it's completely devoid of gender data and sexual rights. One of the chief challenges to privacy is around the protection of personal data and information. Today, massive amounts of data are being generated by individuals by a variety of sources at an unprecedented speed of frequency. Because of innovations in technology, data is important not only to the individual to whom they contain, but they can also be used for a variety of reasons. And again, in case you're wondering how it applies. Um, I'm sure many of you are part of like loyalty clubs. So you go to the store and they give you a loyalty club and they watch what you buy and they give you coupons because of course it's in your interest to say. So in the United States, um, Target, which is a one-shop stop for everything from home to the groceries, established a guest ID for each of its customers. They link to credit card information with age, family status, address, salary, and very importantly, website visitors. So, they can buy data about individuals' ethnicity, job history, the magazine to read, if you own a house or not, your kind of education. And then they analyze this data and predict what you might want to buy next. In the early 2000s, they began analyzing the shopping habits of pregnant women. They, of course, wanted to ensure that women would be shoppers of Target even before their baby was born. And they wanted to know what indicators to look for so they could, of course, tell us what to buy. So they also send them coupons and other shopping incentives. Using data mining, they discovered that women bought large quantities of uncensored lotion around the beginning of the second trimester. In the first 20 weeks, they buy calcium, magnesium, and zinc supplements. And then, my technology is not working. Close to their day, they buy scent free soap, cotton balls, hand sanitizers, and washcloths. So based on this and other information, and um, then began analyzing the shopping habits of a teenage girl, Sarah. And they concluded that she was pregnant. 
The PNT will occur two months to the whole, which then you wish to Advertising came into the later items. The parents received the two months. They had no idea of the material in the payment. So the target moved before them. What does this tell us? It tells us that data is valuable. It tells us that every form we fill in, every time we blindly tick a box on the terms of service agreements on Facebook or Google, or even a little thing, we are actually saying clear. And this has severe implications on our privacy and security. And it's also telling us that non-state actors like the private sector are also a key actor that we need to be engaging the last example is really just to demonstrate how the internet has been used to restrict activists who are working on abortion. Around this time last year, 21st of September, the Latin American and Caribbean Women's Health Network website was hacked and disabled. The attack occurred immediately following the launch of several campaign activities, including the hashtag SLA, I don't speak Spanish, so I'll keep that this, including the hashtag that they were using as part of their social media campaign posted the photo album posters. The advocacy activities were part of the participation in the 28th September Global Day for Action for Action on Access to Safe and Legal Abortion and the 28th September campaign day for the decriminalization of abortion in that country. So around that time, the critical time for the campaigning, the website is hacked. No one knows what's going on, the campaign is completely derailed. But all is not lost. This is really been quite significant to us. That the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders has particularly highlighted the risks that women and human rights defenders are facing, particularly for those working with armed sexuality and particular reproductive health rights. The report states that the risk of stigmatization is a serious threat to the defense of gender or sexuality rights based work because the work of these defenders is perceived as trying to establish social and cultural norms. Traditions or perceptions about the role and status of women in society. It's also important to know that the tactic of closing down the website is not the only one. We also know that as the individual women who have rights defenders are targeted very specifically because they work online. This finding is also supported by the APC um, Global Survey that looked at the risks for women rights defenders working on sexual rights, including reproductive and health rights. LGBT rights, access to safety caution, sexual violence and gay and sex education. From the survey, we found that 99% of activists feel that the internet is a critical tool for advancing the human rights work. Despite this, 51% reported receiving violent or threatening messages online. About one third of the sample mentioned intimidation. 33% mentioned blocking and filtering, and 29% mentioned censorship. This resulted in 27% of them just hunting on the work they were doing online. Clearly, the internet is a space that needs to be protected and defended. And so, to conclude, I want to share with you four principles for a feminist internet that are 15, that I think really critical for all of us to think about. The first is that the internet's role in enabling access to critical information, including conversations on health, pleasure, and risks, is essential and must be supported and protected. The second is that the right to privacy is a critical principle for a safer, open internet for all. And equal attention needs to be paid to surveillance practices by individuals against each other, as well as the private sector and non state actors in addition to the state. The third is that we have the right to access all our personal data online and to be able to exercise control, which includes knowing who has access to the data, under what conditions, and also being able to delete it forever. However, this right also needs to be balanced against the right to access public information, transparency, and accountability. And lastly, the feminist internet is an extension, reflection, and continuum of our movements and resistance in other spaces, both public and private. But our agency lies with us deciding as individuals and collectives what aspects of our lives to politicize or to publicize on the internet.